Hello everyone and welcome to another middle game episode focusing on the rooks with CoachP and MasterChess.com. So far, we've looked at the importance of open or half open files, how to create them, how to fight to dominate them, how to use them to penetrate into the enemy position, and also how to use them to pressure weak enemy pawns. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the enormous power that the rook has on the 7th and 8th rank. So let's get started first looking at a couple of tactical elements that involves the rook and the 8th rank. In this first position, black appears to be okay since all his pieces are defended. He's even created some room for his king with h7 to h6, thinking that that should stop all nasty back rank mates. However, in this position, after queen takes on f8, black can resign. If the king captures the queen, well, rook to d8 is checkmate. And no better is running with the king to h7 because here, after white is up or whole rook, the winning should be very easy. This next position is taken from an actual game that was played in 1912 for the New Zealand Championship. Here, the game has been pretty even up to this point. But after rook to d8 check, bishop f8 and bishop h6, black can resign. There's nothing that he can do to prevent white from gaining a winning advantage. If he tries queen f2 check, white will simply capture the queen, rook takes on f2 and king takes on f2, white will also win the bishop and being up two pieces he's gonna win this game pretty easily. Coming back, even the best continuation that black has with rook to c6 will leave white winning with the queen versus the rook. After rook takes f8, queen takes f8, bishop takes f8, king takes f8, and queen takes on a7, white is up in exchange and will easily win this game. This last position, focusing on the rook and the 8th rank, was taken from a game played in 1939 by George Pelican versus Carlos Scalica. This position was reached after 19 moves, and here with white to move, White takes the knight on d5, from which black captures back with the rook, attacking the queen. And if we look at this position, we could see that black is behind in development, and his king suffers some weakened dark squares. Well, white here will take immediate use of those things, and he plays the excellent move, rook to c8 check. In the game, black replied with bishop to f8, but coming back, no other try will help black, be able to come back. If black responds with king to g7, white can play queen to c1. After f6, white can move the rook to c7, queen b4, rook d2, rook takes d2, bishop takes d2, queen d6, knight e4, queen e6, rook takes e7, check, an excellent move. From here, black is pretty much done. Now I'm just gonna fast forward to the end of this line to see how white will be able to force checkmate. And here black has to sacrifice his queen in order to prevent checkmate, but the game is pretty much over. And coming back after king to g7 and queen to c1, if instead of playing pawn to f6, black tries to get his knight out with knight to d7, this is also not winning for black, as white will respond with bishop to h6 check, king to f6, knight to e4 check, king e6, rook to c6 check, bishop to d6, and then queen to c4, pinning the rook, and there's nothing that black can do to prevent rook takes on d6. The best continuation for black here will be queen to b5, but after rook takes d6, check, king to e7, queen takes on d5, white is up two pieces, and he's easily winning this game. Coming back after rook to c8, check, the best continuation for black here would be to take the rook on c8, and after white captures back on d5, knight to d7, rook to d2, knight to b6 attacking the queen, and queen takes on e5. White is still much better being up a pawn in a much better position, but this would have been the best continuation. However, in the game, after rook to c8, black responded with bishop to f8, and now white responded with queen takes d5. Now black cannot capture the rook on c8 because white will win with queen takes on a8, so here black responded with queen takes d5, Rook to d2, queen to b7, rook d to d8, knight to d7, rook takes on a8, king to g7, b3, 
And looking at this position, black is down material, and I'm just gonna fast forward through the move so you can see how this game concluded and how white won the game. And here, black resigned. If he would have moved the king to f7 after rook to f8 is checkmate, and if black goes to d7 after rook to d8 check, king to c7, rook to c8 check, the king will have to move away and white will win the queen and win the game from here. Next, we're going to take a look at positions that involve the rook and the seventh rank. And what better position to start with than the famous windmill? If you look at this position, you can notice that the black king is stuck on h8 and white has a rook on g7 that is protected by the bishop on b2. Well, because of all the discovered checks, here white is totally winning even though black is up a piece. After rook takes on d7 check, king could only go to g8. And then the rook could come back to g7, king h8, rook takes c7, and then so on, we're gonna keep on taking all the pawns and eventually we take the rook and then we win the game from here. Now this windmill position seemed more like fantasy than reality, but a rook on the 7th rank definitely has serious powers as we're gonna see in our next couple of games. This next position was reached after 20 moves in a game played in 1983 by Silman versus Biasis. Grandmaster Biasis is a fantastic defensive player and one can understand why he thought that he'd be able to hold this quiet endgame. However, his position turns out to be far worse than he imagined. In this game, Silman played knight to b5, and after this, black took on d2 and white took on d2 back. Coming back, here black could have played rook c to c8, however, after bishop takes f6, g takes f6, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, knight takes d8, knight takes a7, white is up a pawn and definitely has more winning chances. Coming back after rook c to c8, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, rook takes d8, it's not any better if here black takes with the knight, because after knight takes d8, rook to d7, bishop c6, rook takes a7, bishop takes b5, c takes b5, White is again much better being up a pawn and also having three versus one pawns on the queen side. So coming back in the game, rook takes on d2 was played, from which white responded rook takes d2, rook to c8, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and rook to d7. And suddenly, black is completely lost. The rook on d7 eyes the pawn on f7, attacks the bishop on b7, and together with the knight, also eyes the pawn on a7. White also has a queenside pawn majority, superior king structure, and also with the active minor pieces, he will prove that this is more than black can handle. So the game continued with rook to b8, from which white replied with pawn to f4, denying black's knight access to the square e5, a6, knight to d6, knight to d4, bishop to h5, bishop to c6, rook c7, rook d8, knight c8, bishop e4, knight takes on b6, and bishop to b1. Coming back, bishop to g6 is also losing. After bishop takes g6, h takes g6, rook to d7. Here, no matter what black responds, the game is lost. If he takes the rook on d7, after knight takes d7, white has a pawn majority on the queen side, 3 versus 1, and definitely he's going to be able to win this game, activating the king and working together with those pawns and the knight. And coming back, if here black doesn't take the rook and he moves something like rook to b8, after rook takes d4, rook takes b6, c5, rook to c6, and b4, white again it has a winning game, thanks to his queen side pawn majority. So coming back, black played bishop to b1 in the game, after which white took on f7 check, king to f8, then bishop to h5. After removing the pawn on f7, white's rook now reigns supreme over the entire 7th rank. The game continued with bishop takes on a2, rook f7 check, 
king to g8, knight to d7. Here white is trying to go for a checkmating pattern, but the game continued with bishop to b1, knight takes f6 check, king to h8, king to f2, knight takes on b3, and then white played the move g4. Here white is intending to push the pawn from f4 to f5, blocking out the black's bishop defense of h7 and forcing mate with rook takes on h7. The game continued with rook to d2 check, king to g3, and from here I'm just going to fast forward so you can see how white checkmated black in just a couple of extra moves. And black got checkmated. As we've seen in this game, the rook on the 7th rank is nice to have, but two rooks on the 7th rank are even better. This creates various material winning scenarios and also sets up many potential checkmates. So let's take a look at this idea in our next game. This next position was reached after 38 moves in a game played by Jorg Marco versus Jack Mises played in 1903. Here white is two pawns up and should win easily. The point of this example is to demonstrate how powerful two rooks on the seventh rank can be. Here it's white to move and white moved the rook to b7 from which the threat of rook to e8 checkmate forces black into a defensive posture playing rook to c8 and now white responded with rook e to e7 doubling up on the seventh rank. And now the game continued with rook to a3, rook h7 check, king to g8, rook b to g7 check, king to f8, rook f7 check, king to g8, not falling for king to e8 because after rook to b7 rook to h8 checkmate on the next move cannot be avoided so coming back the black king move to g8 rook f to g7 check king to f8 rook takes g6 rook c to c3 rook f6 check king g8 rook a7 rook c2 and rook to d6 threatening mate again and thus forcing his opponent back into a passive mode rook to c8 and from here I'm just gonna fast forward through the move so you could see how white won this game and here black resigned being down four pawns there was no point of continuing this last game I want to go over was played by Walter Brownie versus Jeremy Silman in 1999 this position was reached after 25 moves and here black has two rooks on the seventh rank but their effectiveness seemed to be blunted by the bishop on g1 if black can't figure out something he's going to lose this game because the pass pawn on a4 will simply keep on marching till the finish line becoming a queen however here black was able to hold on bringing new reinforcements with knight to h5 white responded with a5 and here black plays an excellent move knight to g3 check sacrificing his knight for an easy in draw position after this white responded with h takes g3 and then rook takes g3 black is down a piece but his control of the seventh rank is enough for him to hold on to an easy draw and the game continued with bishop to c5 rook h3 check king g1 rook g3 check king to f1 Rook takes f3 check, king e1, rook h3, bishop to g1, rook to g3, bishop to f2, and now another excellent move, rook to h3. Threatening to go for checkmate with rook to h1. Here white has to respond with bishop to g1. After rook to g3, bishop to f2, the two players agreed to a draw. Coming back, I do want to mention that after bishop to f2, if black didn't play rook to h3 here and he would have done something like rook to h3, this game now is lost. After this, white could have played the rook to d2. After rook takes d2, king takes d2, rook takes f2 check and king to c3. White is totally winning here thanks to the pass pawn on a5 having a rook behind it. Therefore, rook to h3 was the correct play going for a draw. Alright, thank you so much for watching this video and stay tuned for more lessons. If you liked my video, please subscribe and don't forget to check out my new website, MasterYourChess.com, where you can learn, practice, test and master your chess knowledge.